Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, aviation, it keeps its promise, uh, isn't it? Uh, we will go over and start to speak English at this seminar right now. Uh, I'm very relieved that we have Michael Burns here uh, with us from uh, PVC, uh, who will hold a, a presentation about uh, a study that has been conducted uh, around Orlando and uh, how strategies uh, will develop uh, to, to develop airports. So please, Michael, uh, join us on stage, and the floor is yours. Well, actually, I would say the, the main topic of my uh, presentation is actually about aviation connectivity and the importance of connectivity, the value of connectivity, what has been going on around the world in terms of achieving connectivity through airports. And today I'm proof of that. <laughs> um, seven o'clock this morning, I was still in London. I'm now in front of you. So that demonstrates that actually connectivity works and it actually works through our lander. So that's, uh, that was a good start. In terms of what I'd like to talk to you about, uh, first of all, if we can talk about connectivity and why is it something that airports are being targeted for, why governments see aviation connectivity is important, why business sees it important, and why is this a key issue that in some countries they're actually driving national policy toward. So if you go to certain countries, and we'll talk some case studies about Dubai, and we'll talk about Singapore, they actually will drive the whole of their national development policy around connectivity. Whether that's around a port, an airport, whether that is to do with uh, telecommunications, but connectivity is the key driver in terms of development. And the other thing I'll talk a little bit about is some, um, what I almost call the negative case studies. What happens if you don't have connectivity, or even worse, you lose it? And we've seen some examples here in Europe. I've been doing a lot of work with the European Commission, uh, looking at what happened in Budapest when they lost Malif. They lost an airline, they lost their national carrier, and they lost connectivity. And I'll talk a little bit about what that actually meant to the Hungarian economy and to Hungary. But I'll also talk about a little bit about the United States. Because in the United States, we are seeing a phase of de-hubbing with the airlines. So what we're actually seeing is certain airports no longer the focus of aviation activity. And we see examples of airports where they've gone from 30 million passengers to less than 10 million passengers overnight. Now that has a huge impact in terms of the local economy and the local city. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then some general themes about if you are looking at boosting connectivity and you're looking about policies to actually maximize the value of the airport, what are some of the key themes and some of the key lessons that we see when we look around the world? So starting off, if we, if, if we look at connectivity, what makes connectivity important? I suddenly realize I have a very, very small screen here. Why is, why is connectivity important? In terms of the attractiveness of a city, the airport is increasingly being seen as the key beacon in terms of getting inward investment into that city and in terms of allowing the businesses within that city and with that region and within that country to grow and develop. We're all part of a global economy. If you do not have the ability to connect to the markets around the world, whether those are financial markets, manufacturing markets, communications markets, you are suddenly at a huge disadvantage. So connectivity becomes key. The sort of things that cities are looking for in terms of aviation connectivity include regional headquarters. I spent a lot of time uh, in my earlier career working for the government in Australia. And one of my jobs was to look at how we attracted regional headquarters into Australia. And it was a big battle because any of you who, who've ever been to Australia know it's a very big place. And while we like to think in Australia that we're very close to Asia, actually we're a long way away. To get from Sydney to Singapore is seven hours. So we're not really that central. However, 
the Australian government was very successful in driving regional headquarters, saying to American companies and saying to European companies, if you want to base in Asia, base in Australia. Because we have flights and we have connections all through the region. We're close to Southeast Asia. We are in the same time zone. Massively successful and hugely important in terms of diversification of the Australian economy, which effectively is based on agricultural and mineral products. So that is seen as key. So regional headquarters, how do you attract businesses in? And in terms of the Swedish case, how do you see yourselves as being the centre in terms of Europe? If I'm a Japanese company, a US company, a company de uh, developing in the new economies, why should they come to Stockholm? Why should they come to Sweden to set up? The next area, inbound and outbound investment. When you talk to investors about why they choose certain countries to invest in, you actually get some very, very strange answers. One of the things we saw in the UK is that when British Airways has a direct flight to a new market, all of a sudden, outbound investment goes up by 50% and inbound investment goes in up by 75%. Now, these are not cities that you could not have got to through a hub somewhere in the world and could have connected through. But all of a sudden, because you have a direct flight and direct connection, people suddenly realise, oh, that's a market that we can actually, that we can actually service. There seems to be a psychology there that direct connections drive business connections and business relationships. So that seems to be a key driver in terms of why you need to have connectivity. Being able to be able to go through somebody else's hub doesn't seem to actually be good enough in the market today. And the last area is, as I said, the access to global markets. The world is changing. Trade patterns are changing. The markets that we've traditionally been connected to aren't necessarily the markets that are going to grow. Europe is going to grow less than 3%. The US is growing around about 3%. If you want 7, 8, 9, 10% growth, you have to be in Southeast Asia, you have to be in Latin America. Increasingly, you're going to have to be in Africa. In order to actually get your products, your services, drive your human capital into those markets, you need to have connectivity. You need to have direct flights into those marketplaces. On this slide, we've just got some, some numbers and statistics. There have been various studies that have been done uh, over the last 10 years, all looking at the value of connectivity, the value of flights, the value of connections to, ve to the economies around the world. What you generally get is a picture of around about 1 to 2% GDP uplift. That's a permanent uplift whenever you make huge strides in terms of connectivity. One of the studies I'm working with right now is in London, where we're looking at the issue of whether or not we build new runways. And one of the drivers of where those runways will be will be the discussion about where do we actually get the biggest bang for our buck. If we put the runway at Heathrow or Gatwick, or if we build a new airport, what will that mean in terms of the economic generations in London and how that will affect the actual, the actual economy. And what we see is having the connectivity through London and not losing connectivity through Schiphol or Paris uh, or through uh, Frankfurt adds around about 1% to 2% in terms of GDP. That's a, that's a huge increase in terms of the, of, of the economy. And as I said, so there's various studies that demonstrate that. So we come back to, well, is there any proof? <laughs> If we actually look at those cities, those airports which have driven connectivity, do we see growth? And the reality is, yes, we do. What we've looked here on this side is we've looked at Singapore. Now, Singapore is an interesting case study. The Singapore government worked out very early that their key advantage was purely geographic. This is back in the late 60s, early 70s. They're at the center of Southeast Asia. They had traditionally been a port. 
they now recognised, however, that if they were going to grow their economy, they had broken away from Malaysia, and effectively formed their city-state, they needed to get regional headquarters based there. They needed to be a centre of education, a centre for health, and a centre for business. And a key part of that strategy was the building of Changi Airport. And what they realised was, through having a national carrier, and this is where national investment, government investment's key, a national carrier with new aircraft from Singapore Airlines, by having a, a modern and new uh, hub airport, which was Changi, um, but also having a regulator and Department of Transport that was focused on what was actually required to actually develop the airport, they were able to achieve huge amounts of growth. And they took advantage, and this will become a theme, they took advantage of their geography. And they took advantage of the technology. And the best piece of technology for the Singaporeans was the 747-400. Because for the first time, you could fly direct from Europe to Singapore, non-stop. Now, why anybody would want to go to Singapore at that time, everybody was wondering about that. But the key thing was, it was the closest you could get to Australia, and it was the closest you could get to the other Southeast Asian markets, one stop. So from Singapore, they were able to offer one-stop connections for the very first time to the whole of Southeast Asia, and they were able to create the kangaroo route. So Singapore, all of a sudden, is producing way more passengers than their own population. They're doing it as a, tran as a transport hub. But very quickly, they realised that that wasn't enough. And in fact, if you see now, technology has moved forward. We can now fly beyond Singapore. Very soon, you'll probably be able to fly to Australia direct. So what they worked on was, well, what does this give us in terms of the more general economy? And what it was about was, as I said, looking at fo focusing on what they could do in terms of developing human capital, developing businesses and technology-related jobs, finance-related jobs for the Singapore economy. That became the key. As technology has shifted, as geography, in a way, the strength of geography has shifted, what do the Singaporeans now do? They are no longer going to be a global hub. They can be overflown. The new hubs in the Gulf allow you to fly from Dubai and from Abu Dhabi directly to Australia. You can fly directly to the markets in the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia. What they've now become is actually withdrawn to become an Asian hub. And what they're now doing is connecting all the small cities, all the new cities, which have half a million population, a million population today, but will be doubling, trebling, quadrupling over the next five to 10 years. And they've recreated that connections market. Probably the biggest case study is Dubai. If you look at the growth rates in terms of aviation in Dubai, it's, it's pretty astounding. I can tell you now that the, what they did in, in, in Dubai was basically follow the Singapore case. They observed, they saw what Singapore had done, they were in a very similar position. They were city-state, had traditionally been a port, were looking to grow the economy beyond simply being a transportation hub. So how did they do that through connectivity? Again, what they did was they realised you had to connect the airlines and making sure, again, through national carriers, you built a network. You needed to build the infrastructure and build an infrastructure ahead of the curve. That's what they did at Dubai Airport. Well, they continue to do building new airports. But also they had a national strategy that looked at what were the industries that would be attracted through this transport hub, through connectivity, and making sure that they came. So looking at, OK, we want to target the finance sector, the arts and entertainment sector. We want high-tech manufacturing. And they've attracted that in, but they could only attract that in with those connections. Dubai also had another advantage. In the same way that the 747-400 allowed Singapore to become a, a key hub. The A380 has effectively allowed 
uh, Dubai to do the same thing. You can now connect to 90% of the world from the Gulf region. It's a geographical accident. The difference in Dubai is they took advantage of the geography. They had the foresight to see that the investment in infrastructure and the investment in operations could allow them to take advantage of where they were <laughs> and effectively create a new economy and a new business. Tell us a little bit about why cities do this and a little bit about the importance of connectivity. The counter cases. So we'll start with Budapest. As you know, about two years ago, Malev, the national carrier in Hungary, collapsed. It wasn't resurrected. There was no new carrier created within Hungary. However, today, Budapest Airport does around about the same number of passengers than it did two years ago. So if I go to the airport and I say, this must have been terrible, they'll say, well, actually, no, it's okay. We've, we've managed to keep all our passengers, and that's all working really well. When you then talk to the government about what's happened, you get a very different story. Because what happened was direct connections to major European business centres disappeared. They still have connections, but they're not quite to the same place. So the connections to London are no longer to Heathrow, they're to Luton, through Wizz Air. They've lost their connection directly to Brussels, but you can go to Shalwa, again with Wizz Air or with Ryanair. You can't get to Frankfurt anymore. You have to fly on Ryanair to Hahn. They've lost their key connections. They also lost their connection to New York, and they lost their only connections east, their connections to the Gulf, uh, and their connections into Asia. So what's happened, and this, this again becomes important when we talk about connectivity, not all passengers are equal. I hate to say it, but it's true. If you're looking at economic development and you're looking at job creation, what you're looking for is business connectivity, the ability for businesses to connect to their markets. I, would talk, I was talking to some business people in Budapest. They said, look, in the old days, I could fly to Brussels in the morning by dinner time. Today, it's three days for me to get there. I have to make three connections. It's not practical for me to do overnight business anymore. That is a cost. So what do I do? I drive to Vienna, which is three hours away. That's hardly effective or efficient. What you are finding is they're getting a lot more low-cost routes, but the low-cost routes don't provide onward connections. When you actually look at connectivity indexes, one of the important things is it's not just how many places you are connected to, it's what happens when the people get to those places. If you connect to Heathrow, or you connect to Frankfurt, or you connect to uh, Paris Charles de Gaulle, you then open up the rest of the world. If you connect into New York, or you connect into some of the US hubs, you open up the Americas. If you connect into an Asian hub, you open up Asia. If all your new connections are purely leisure flights, or they're flying point to point to secondary airports, all of a sudden you lose a huge amount of value. And that's exactly what we've seen when we look in, at Hungary. And the problem is now they've actually lost control of their aviation industry because the airlines that are flying are flying outside in. So they have no control in terms of route development. They are basically going and competing with everybody else in terms of gaining routes. If we look at the US case, the US case has actually been quite dramatic over the last five or six years. We've gone from six to three major carriers in the US, not counting Southwest. What that has meant has been that we don't need all the hubs that we've had. So I do a lot of work with uh, the mayors of places like St. Louis and Kansas City. These are traditional transportation hub, Midwestern cities, which have actually grown on the fact that they're on the Mississippi River, so they've been part of the, the maritime uh, networks. 
They're part of the road networks, because in the centre of the country, and they've been part of the air networks. These were the hubs for TWA, for Pan Am, way back, uh, way back 20 years ago. They built airports for 30 to 40 million passengers. They had 30 to 40 million passengers going through their cities. They were able to attract national and global businesses to set themselves up in their cities because of that through traffic, the fact that you could connect to the world. As those airlines have died, as the airlines have consolidated their hubs, as I said, they've gone from 30, 40 million passengers down to 9 or 10 million passengers. They're now basically serving purely the passengers for their home market, nothing else. This has meant that major corporations have left. It has meant that they've lost jobs. In the case of uh, Kansas City, they lost something like 8,000 uh, engineering jobs when they lost TWA. And with that, they lost their engineering training base. So the universities no longer were able to attract students, which meant all the other companies were also moving out as well. So losing your connectivity has severe issues. So to summarise, what are the key things that governments can do, that airports can get involved in, uh, and that politicians can get involved in, in terms of improving connectivity and driving through a coherent pattern in terms of connectivity? I think the first thing is you need to take advantage of infrastructure. If you don't build ahead of the curve, you can't be seen to be providing the infrastructure to allow business to grow. That doesn't mean you have to go and invest billions in investment and sort of pray that they will come. What it does mean is working in coordination with national businesses, looking at national policies, and predicting what is going to be required and making sure that that provision is put in place. You don't want to be in the situation that we're in in London, where we, are, we give away 20% of the traffic at Schiphol Airport today is UK regional traffic. That's traffic that should have come through Heathrow. It doesn't, why? Because Heathrow's full. It's not wanted. If you are flying an aircraft of less than 100 passengers, we don't want you at Heathrow, go to Schiphol. We don't want your business anymore. Well, that's regional UK business that's being turned away. So you don't want to be in a situation that you get so far behind in terms of infrastructure, you, you're actually losing markets. Base airlines are important. It doesn't have to be a national carrier. It could be a low-cost carrier. It can be leisure carriers. It could be full-service carriers. It could even be corporate jet operators. What is important is having the aircraft based in your city and at your airport. Because base aircraft create jobs. All the services, whether it be catering, maintenance, uh, reservations, uh, cleaning, they're all done wherever the aircraft is based. When the UK put in APD, uh, our passenger duty, about five years ago, um, what that meant was EasyJet on day one shifted four aircraft away from Newcastle. That was 800 jobs. We know that, we actually were able to measure and identify all the jobs that went as soon as the base aircraft went. They didn't stop flying to Newcastle, they just started flying from Eastern Europe to Newcastle and back and basing the aircraft in Eastern Europe. But it did have a direct effect in terms of the economy. And then the last two things I think which are key, the economic framework I think is key and the regulatory framework. They all have to be working in unison. If you take the lessons from Singapore and the lessons from Dubai today about why they're so powerful in terms of aviation connectivity and why they're so successful, it's because there's coordination. They make sure that their regulatory frameworks aren't weak. In fact, they make sure they're very strong. They are world class. That way, any airline can get cheap insurance. Any airline can safely fly to their hubs and know that they will have a safe and efficient operation. Economic policy also is consistent. 
taxation is driven around outputs from aviation rather than the inputs. So again, tax, taxation is, is, is arranged in such a way that you effectively benefit, the government benefits when more people fly, and also benefits from the industries that grow and the employment that grows around it, rather than taxing the inputs. So if you put that together, taking advantage of, a of your geographic positioning, Sweden has a fantastic geographic positioning between Northern Europe and Asia. Always has. And we've seen that if we look at Finnair, we see Finnair take advantage of that all the time. If we look at base carrier, SAS is restructuring, but you have a network, you have a carrier, you have the one of the advantages you have over places like the Gulf is you actually have a domestic aviation industry. You actually have the ability to take population from Scandinavia and feed it through a hub. They have to find the population from elsewhere. It's not from their own region. You have some advantages in terms of infrastructure. You have the basis of infrastructure, very high quality infrastructure and very well regarded. It's how does that expand and how does that grow? And then the final piece in terms of the economic framework. How do you put the glue together? How do you look at investment in the aviation sector as part of your investment in growing human capital, growing financial capital, and growing industrial capital in the economy? Because unless it's part of a single picture, and I always look at transport as being an input. We don't transport goods and services and people for the fun of it. It doesn't actually produce anything. We, pr we transport goods as an element of trade. We transport people, whether that be for business or for leisure, which generates jobs in terms of tourism and hospitality. So it's by putting all of these together and having a, at least a connected policy, you're able to take advantage of connectivity, grow your markets, and develop and grow the aviation sector. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we will bring you up on stage a little bit, but just uh, one question. It, it's, uh, uh, would you say that, that um, uh, the, the legislatures uh, are aware of this uh, phenomenon? Because, I mean, uh, in, in, in Hungary, for instance, you, you, you mentioned that when, when Malev uh, disappeared, uh, they, they were quite quickly back up when it came to passenger numbers, but the connecti connectivity was, mm. was uh, gone. Uh, and this didn't really affect the airport, but it did affect the society. Would you say that, um, uh, in general, uh, that, that uh, legislatures and, and authorities are aware of this uh, phenomenon? Well, the work I've been doing for the European Commission, um, if you'd asked the European Commission a year ago, they probably would have said uh, Hungary was an example of the success. Okay of having an open European market in aviation because the passenger numbers are back, cities are reconnecting, it's all going well. When we actually looked at the detail, that's when we actually saw that actually what we were seeing was a different type of growth, leisure growth. Mm. We were seeing different types of connectivity, again, leisure connectivity. And what had been lost was actually key. And I was talking to some business leaders and they said, we used to have five-star hotels that were full with some of the best medical conferences. We were the center for medical conferences around the world. Now we have uh, stagnites and Hindus from the UK and people coming over because we have cheap beer and cheap bars. That's not the type of tourism that we wanted. And what we've lost is the core in terms of the high skilled economy that we actually had and we were trying to develop. So I think they're beginning to realize that losing that connectivity is actually much more pervasive and much more important in terms of the general well-being of the economy. Thank you very much. Uh, an applaud to Michael. We will bring him up a little bit later again.